When OpenSea released the C port upgrade, it reported that the use of assembly in a Solidity code reduced gas fees by 35%, saving its customers an estimated $460 million per year. Today I'll go through some simple examples of how and when to use assembly code in your Solidity smart contracts. My name is James Buccini and on this channel I create content about decentralized finance and blockchain development. Please bear in mind that the code that you're about to see is experimental, untested and not fit for production. And in some cases it's downright hideous. Okay, let's jump into this first example. So the assembly that you're seeing here is a form of assembly which in the Ethereum docs they call it Yule. It's expanded and simplified and it's designed to make it more readable. So we've got a simple function here on opcode called sStore and that is storing a value, which is this new value we're passing in, which is an unsigned integer to the zero uh, position. So the first uh, memory allocation slot is storing this number basically. And we're setting that to storage. So there's three different places that you can store data on the Ethereum virtual machine. There's the stack, which operates kind of a FIFO, first in, first out system, where you're kind of pushing data to the top of the stack and then popping it out. That's the cheapest place to kind of work with data. Then you have memory, which is basically, well, I think of it as like RAM. It starts to get more expensive when you start storing data in memory and certain things like arrays, they actually have to allocate them. If you've been working with Solidity some time, you know you have to kind of put in where you're storing that uh, information. And then finally you have account storage or persistent storage, which is kind of, I think of it as like the hard drive of the machine. So once your program or your smart contract finish, finishes executing, it might hold an account balance for a user or some data like that, which is stored on the decentralized network. And that's what we're gonna access here. We're gonna use the sStore opcode to store this value. And that's gonna store the data in storage so it's persistent. We've also got a function called get data, and this is gonna go in and fetch that data and return it to us. And all we're doing here is we're gonna use sload, which is the equivalent of sStore. So we're loading data from storage from that slot zero in the smart contract. And then we can't return that data directly. So we actually have to store it in memory before we can return it. So we're returning a uint256, and all we're gonna do is we're gonna load that to the 0x80 uh, storage position, which is v is just a variable here that we're loading it from. I probably could name that better. And then we're gonna return that as a 32 byte unsigned integer. This is quite a good example because it's using persistent storage and memory storage to do different things. And these are called opcodes, if we scroll down here, there's a list of useful opcodes and there's an even bigger list on the uh, Solidity documentation. And this is how we build our functions in assembly. We use these different opcodes to manipulate the data and store it in different places. And it gives us a lower level control of how our program executes and stores data. Let's deploy this and run it so I can show you how it works. And we're just gonna add a number here, set data. Wait for that to go through and retrieve the data. So that's one for one. Let's move on to the next example. The next one is send ETH. So this is gonna be a contract which, if there's ETH within a contract or Ethereum uh, native tokens within a contract, then we wanna be able to withdraw that, but only two owners can withdraw that. And we set that at the start before we get into the assembly. So we've got an array here, We've restricted it to uh, a length of two, and we've got two addresses here which are allowed to withdraw the Ethereum. Then we've got an external payable function here, and we've got an address, two, and an amount. So basically what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna send this one ETH, and I'm gonna try and withdraw half an ETH. Not particularly useful, but it's a good way to start demonstrating how we can use loops and statements within our assembly code. So we've set a Boolean outside of the assembly of success and we're later gonna to check to see if that success has, is true. So a Boolean is just true or false. And there's a require statement here which basically reverts the whole transaction if that's uh, failed to go through. Now let's jump into the assembly and go through this code. So we've got a for loop here and this should look pretty familiar if you dive into it. We've got i equals zero. If i is less than two, continue with the loop and then I add one each time you do the loop. So we're then gonna set the owner to load the storage value of I. 
So in this contract, we've got the first two values as zero and one are the first two values in this array. It's the first thing we've done within the contract. Not a particularly good way or a secure way of doing this. I wouldn't recommend this code was deployed to mainnet, for example, but for the purposes of this demonstration, it's fine. So we're gonna set the owner value to each of these addresses, and then we're gonna use an if statement if the two value that is a user-defined value to this function is equal to one of the owners, then we're gonna send them the amount of ETH. We're doing that via a call function or a call opcode, which passes the remaining gas, the person you're sending to, and then the amount of ETH that you wanna send. Let's go and try this out in the console, and we're gonna get rid of this storing data contract. And let's deploy send ETH. I'm gonna to have to send this some ether with the contract code, and then I'm gonna to have to copy one of these addresses. So address first, and then the amount, I'm gonna put, this is in Y, we're sending a lot, so that should work. And you can see that's gone through. If we change the address value by a couple of digits, you get an error, bad address checksum. Let's, tr let's just check. If we scroll up, we can check the account balances. You see this is the first address that we sent the ETH to and that's gone through. If we try a random address, which should actually work with the checksum, draw ETH and fail to send ETH because that address is not part of the owners of this contract. So another fairly simple example there, but you can see how we're starting to use for loops and if statements to control the logical flow of the application. This next example is a little bit more complicated and it looks a bit daunting at first glance. That's fine, it's something I find with assembly. When you first look at it, it can be quite abstract and it's not as clear as when you're looking at the program flow through Solidity. But if you kind of get into it and you kind of go look through what's going on and take your time to understand the, the functions and if it's well commented as well, which this one isn't, having a basic understanding of assembly and low level data management can help you read and understand what's going on in third party developers contracts. So in this contract, we're passing in a input string and a Boolean for decrypt. It's gonna be if you wanna decrypt it or encrypt it. And this is called useless encryption because it is exactly that. It's an external pure function. It's gonna output a string to memory. So we're setting a variable type to 32 bytes and we're calling that the output. So we're defining our output variable before we get into the assembly. And then as you can see, we started to put in some functions. So this first function, string to bytes, it simply takes a text string that we're gonna pass it, and then it can convert that to ones and zeros and like a byte array. You'll notice again, we're using 32 bytes. The reason for that is that everything on the Ethereum virtual machine is built around these 32 byte slots. The next function add to bytes is our encryption algorithm, if we can call it that. And all we're doing here is if we wanna decrypt it, so if decrypt is set to false, we're gonna add 0, 1 to each bytecode. So if we know that all data gets compiled down to binary, so it's ones and zeros, we can represent that with a hex string. So a capital A, for example, is the character code 41. B is 42, C is 43. And all we're doing here is adding 0, 1 to each letter. So we have a 32 byte string, so there's 32 characters available, and we're gonna increase each one by 0, 1. And the same with the decrypt function, all we're doing is subtracting 0, 1 to get back to our original text. We're then calling them functions in turns, so string to bytes, and then passing the output of that byte string into the add to bytes function to get our value back. This will then set our output, which we set to a 32 byte variable. However, we're passing back a string here, so it's more readable. And all we're doing is converting that back to a, a string using a, a simple for loop in Solidity. This is obviously very oversimplified and I don't think the NSA are gonna to need to build a supercomputer to break this. Let's deploy this and see if it works. So useless encryption, let's encrypt the word test. And you can see we've got this. And then if we paste this in, you can see it's appended a lot of these 01 type boat codes. Actually, they would generally be 00 because there's nothing after the test. It's just blank. And if we set decrypt to true, and you can see we can convert it back to the word test. 
Simple, useless, but a good demonstration of how to use functions to start adding more programmable logic within our assembly code. All the code that we've gone through so far is available on the blog post linked to the description. I think one of the best ways you can actually start to get better at assembly is just simply copy and paste code from myself or third party developers into Remix and start experimenting with it and building out your own functions. Like anything, the more you use it, the more comfortable you become with that low level memory data management. For me, there is a cost of using assembly and Solidity. And that's both in terms of readability, but also having to think about the stack and how you're kind of moving data in and out of the functions. I like the way that Solidity takes care of all of that. It means I can concentrate on the coding, what I'm trying to do, and have some of those technicalities abstracted away. The places where I think that assembly makes a lot of sense is in small, pure functions, which kind of are used throughout a contracts or in libraries where there's a simple change to assembly on a simple function which you can probably understand what it does just by the function name it makes a lot of sense because it can save costs throughout the contract where those functions are used for blockchain developers i think there's two ways you can kind of start to look at this one is to start using assembly straight from the offset and kind of if you've got a small library or a function that you're going to use repeatedly to kind of code that from the start in assembly the other way is to kind of, when you start getting to the testing phase, so you can kind of do the creative process of writing the code in Solidity, which is more high level. And then once you start getting to like the unit testing stage and trying to optimize that code, you can then maybe convert some of the regularly used functions into assembly and a lot of the frameworks like Hard Hat and Foundry will actually give you gas optimization reports so you can see how the changes to your code are affecting the gas cost for your transactions. And that's a great way to start using assembly to optimize your gas cost and the performance of your smart contracts. I hope that this introduction to assembly facility has been useful. Please hit the like button for the YouTube algorithm and subscribe to the channel for updates. Thank you for watching.